we can just ask it. Sure. Not going to have any worries or stress in this presentation, okay? <laughs> There you are. I got oh, there it to we work. Are. Good. <laughs> Thanks, Nadine. Okay, so as we, uh, hopefully everybody's back as we get ready for Pat's presentation, very um, excited to have uh, Pat Ferris uh, with us today, who, um, who has worked across a broad variety of industries over her uh, 40 years. Uh, and uh, has done a lot of work with other health and safety associations. And we're just really pleased to have you here today, Pat, um, to talk to our group. Um, so uh, we did launch a poll. You got it to work, Nadine? I don't see it on my screen, but anyways. Yeah, it um, is working. It's on your screen, okay. Yeah, so it's um, uh, up. Uh, let's just give it a moment. People are, are coming in. Yep, you got, we got 12. We're about a quarter way. Okay, you can share the results. Yep. Forty percent. Sixty percent. Give it a couple more minutes here. A couple more seconds, I guess, not minutes. <laughs> All right. Seventy percent. Okay, do you want me to close it? Yeah, sure. All right. So I'm sharing the results. Can you see that, Dana? I can see it. Can you see the results, Pat? Yeah, I can, and I'm just uh, writing them down. Isolation 23. Okay, so the, the question was, what do you think stresses continuing care staff the most? 37% um, said fatigue, uh, followed by 23% uh, saying witnessing isolation death. 21% uh, uh, said uh, being in direct contact with COVID positive cases. And then 19% uh, indicated worry about their families. 0% voted for have access to PPE. Sounds like you're doing a good job in that area. Yeah. All right. Uh, just let me know if I'm good to go. You're good to go. Okay. Um, I'm always amazed after a year of using uh, Zoom how, how many issues come up. So now can we can we get the poll taken down? There we go. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for the privilege of, uh, of, of presenting to your group. Uh, if WCB folks are still on and listening in, um, I, I, I work a lot, actually, I'm considered an international expert in the area of workplace bullying. Uh, so I really appreciated your presentation. Um, and the work that I've done uh, with, with WCB on those kinds of cases, I, I found WCB to be really helpful. Uh, and, and, and really good. So um, I may reference your presentation uh, a bit. Um, I know that we're talking, when we're talking about continuing care, we're talking about a really wide variety of workers. So when I go through this presentation, I'm going to try and talk in general, but I'm also going to refer a lot to um, to, to, to COVID times, how we apply the concept of resilience uh, uh, in times of COVID and in a workforce that um, has generally a high stress job uh, um, at, at the best of times. So, dear, here we go. There we go. So I apologize for my fingers or anything that happens on Zoom. Uh, so I do wanna go over what is mental health, what is resilience. I wanna talk about how you create community, how you support your essential people um, and what kinds of or 
I want to talk first about individual strategies and secondly about organizational strategies and, and, and how to know when you or someone else needs uh, more help. So some of this uh, may be a bit of an overlap with the WCB presentation, but that's never a bad thing. So I want to ask, uh, and I would, I would ask people to put in chat, how do you think uh, the employees in the continuing care setting are doing. We saw you know, WCB claims, you know, down in general. Uh, but what do you think? If you'd put a few things in, in chat while I continue to talk, then we can uh, all look at that. Okay, so what is, what is mental health? Uh, again, if people could take a moment and put some things in chat, I'm just looking for my chat here. And um, Dana, are you seeing chat? Yep, we're seeing chat. It's hard to see when you're in full screen and sharing your screen. So we'll yeah, keep an so, eye on that for you. So, you so some of the things mind. that we're hearing, Pat, are long haul is wearing people out, exhaustion from dealing with all of the restrictions. Our two comments that have come in so far. And absolutely what I'm seeing in almost everybody. I, I have a general practice, um, but I see, uh, I really specialize in healthcare. So I see a lot of doctors, nurses, um, all sorts of techs. Um, you know, I've done uh, a lot of work in, um, in um, continuing care and disability homes. So what you're telling me is really consistent with what I'm seeing in everybody else. And I've, I've got a slide that's going to talk to that. Is there anything else that um, I, I need uh, to look at before? Uh, I'm just looking sure, at Sure, in regards to how um, people are doing, how our continuing care workers are doing, um, we had one comment. Uh, I feel it's hard as individuals have nothing really to afford to, feel restricted. I think people, people are tired and it's wearing on them. I think the yo yo effect with the restrictions is frustrating people as well. Um, there's some different direction from different departments uh, or levels of AHS. Mm -hmm. um, a recent New York Times article this week describes it as languishing. And I found that this article summed it up in a word, um, talked about creating flow. And then we've had uh, two other comments here. Workers get real, uh, easily get triggered as they are holding in a lot of pressure. And finally, mental health is our predominant emotion. Um, emotional and psychological well-being also oh, sorry so that was in response to the question what is mental health okay that 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 is that's those are those comments are are really good and it's what i'm hearing from most of my clients uh and when i'm doing presentations like that these are the issues that are coming up we're we're really in a long haul uh the restrictions uh just in general are taking their toll on people um any the yo-yo effect of this, that, different directives, the, the need for constant change in thinking, uh, and the feeling like we're, we're we're just not moving forward. <laughs> One of my colleagues in Montreal, where they've been locked down a lot, you know, describes it as a uh, constant Groundhog Day. So I want you know what is mental health? Um, it's a sense of purpose and a sense of accomplishment. Uh, and so when we look at what's happening to purpose and accomplishment in, in days of COVID, you know, what I'm hearing is it's hard for some people to live purpose. Uh, it's hard to see other people not living purpose, um, anti-maskers, um, um, people going away on holidays. Uh, and it's hard to feel a sense of accomplishment because things are hard to do. Um, and, and again, we're so restricted in the activities and, you know, in the work that we can do. You know, so mental health means strong relationships. And if, if I see anything really being impacted in this time is, is the relationship aspect. We're struggling, I see couples fighting in their relationships over different values around what to do around COVID, relationships that were strained, kind of cracking. 
work relationships um, changing. We're doing everything um, over Zoom. Uh, people are feeling isolated. Um, and, you know, in continuing care, probably the relationship with patients and clients is changing in a sense that people can't feel that they can do uh, all that they can. I can't touch anybody anymore. Uh, we all have to wear masks in my practice. So that impacts the relationships. You know, and the third again is feeling connected. So uh, feeling connected to others at work. We used to be able to have meetings. We used to be able to come in and chat. And now, you know, in, in my offices, um, there's hardly anybody there. We have to distance, we have to mask. It's really hard to feel that connection. And having a good sense of self. Uh, I'm finding that through the through all the just the daily grind and the issues that come up with COVID, uh, that people's what I would consider their their gas tank or their bucket of coping skills, uh, you know, is is getting lower and lower. Um, the and the exhaustion that you're talking is related to that, and it really impacts people's sense of self, of their ability to control their environment, and their ability to control themselves. And then the last one, coping with stress. So I don't know if there's folks out there that are feeling COVID fatigue, which is just a chronic underlying sense of it, just things are hard, I'm tired. Um, or if anybody's had what I'm calling COVID crashes, and I'll talk about those in a bit, um, but I have, um, uh, you know, I'll admit that. So coping just with, with the ongoing stress of COVID, not to mention all the other things that may go on in life, um, has really um, decreased our ability to cope for most people. And then the, of course, the ability to enjoy life. You know, we like to go out, we like to socialize, we like to travel. That's a really big thing for myself. Uh, and a lot of that is restricted. So keeping mental health uh, in the face of jobs that are difficult, um, and can be stressful at, at the best of times uh, with the layer of COVID added on uh, really makes it a stretch to do that. So what I, I wanna talk about today is, um, is the resilience. How do we, how do we create resilience uh, in a time where it's hard to be resilient? So just a bit of the landscape. Um, I, I did some research on um, a continuing care professionals in particular, uh, and you can see uh, that 70% of healthcare workers in general um, and 77% of healthcare workers in direct contact with confirmed or suspected COVID are reporting worsening mental health. And that's very recent, that's February uh, of this year. So, so we can assume that uh, people's sense of their own mental well being. Um, it is decreasing um, and that the majority of people who have contact uh, with, uh, with COVID uh, positive or possible COVID cases, and that includes the work that I do. I mean, I've had about a dozen clients uh, test positive. I've had to go for tests. Um, we've had to rearrange things. Um, it's stressful. Uh, now, the, the other bullet sounds like you're doing really great on personal protective equipment, um, because if people don't have access to that, um, that's a very, that, that, that is incredibly stressful. So sounds like you're doing real well there. Um, uh, and the last one I want to talk about that I think we need to be aware uh, and I had put a comment in chat, is that I did a lot of work with healthcare professionals during um, H1N1. Uh, and what happened after, after that, when people could stop and think about what happened is I saw a lot of people feeling quite psychologically traumatized uh, and that they had developed what we call a moral injury um, because they felt that they had witnessed um, things that hurt people, harm people. So people being exposed, people not getting vaccines, um, 
people being hurt by people who didn't take care of themselves. Those, um, those were the kinds of things that people were coming to see me about. So I want you to be very aware that not just during COVID, but as we go forward and after uh, that, I think it's after that we're going to see a great deal of exhaustion because people can let it happen then. And just again, the Institute for Employee Studies are, you know, it's reflecting what you, uh, what you said were the big issues is that um, when we have stress, we get increased muscle pain. Uh, when we get stressed, we produce a lot of cortisol and um, that actually uh, triggers our body to crave um, um, the bad foods, give us energy so we can defend against this, uh, this threat. Um, we do the comfort things like alcohol, uh, we, we lose sleep, um, we start to feel isolated, we worry about our families, and that's a big thing right now with, um, that I'm finding with people who have kids at school, uh, is that they're incredibly worried for the kids and for themselves. So just please people feel um, free to put anything in chat that you, you know, any questions as we go along that you'd like me to to chat about. So what we're seeing um, at this point now is, is, is a burnout from, uh, from COVID. People are getting lower and lower energy. And you know when we talk about burnout, um, it shows up in that exhaustion, that lack of energy. Um, we often get very detached from the work that we do. We stop feeling like we're accomplishing anything. Uh, and of course, those kinds of conditions play, um, our thoughts play a very big um, negative role on our neurotransmitters. Uh, and we get a more global feeling. It's partly depression, it's partly exhaustion, fatigue uh, that comes. So what I'm getting from what I'm hearing from some of the chat in the previous presentation and this one uh, is that uh, you're seeing you're starting, if you're seeing a lot of fatigue, you're starting to see burnout. Uh, and uh, we all know that fatigue is related to accidents, to depression, to all sorts of not good things. So if you're seeing fatigue, you can guess that your people's resilience is um, being really challenged um, and that they're getting burned out. And so we wanna talk about oh, what in this environment can we do about that? So I said I had a, a slide that would talk about um, COVID um, and um, coping versus crashing. You know, we're, we're seeing as hope goes up about COVID, you know, being over, getting vaccines, um, then maybe not, we've got waves of this. What I was finding in the beginning is that people would say, I just feel fatigued and I don't know why. Uh, and part of the reason is that um, we don't have the normal things that we have to do to, to combat fatigue, to go out, to have fun, to do things that we enjoy. Um, but we also, um, it takes so much longer to do everything. Everything requires, do I go out to this store? Do I do this? Do I do that? Everything requires levels and levels of decision-making that... Um, that exhaust us uh, uh, and, and it, it kind of is a lower level that rides underneath everything, but there's times it just overwhelms us. You know, while others have seen COVID as a bit of a reprieve, um, the retired folks, uh, people that had worked from home anyways, haven't been too affected by this, but anybody who's out there at working and working with a population that needs a lot of care is likely been experiencing COVID fatigue for quite some time. I've developed a COVID coping scale. I'll show you at the end of the uh, end of the session, which you will be. Well, I'll, I'll leave, and you'll be welcome to access and give to your workers so that you understand where they are over time. But people are reporting um, that they feel anxious uh, versus having control. They feel uncertain. We can't get any strong idea of when things are over, what's happening all the different yo-yo effects that you've talked about create greater uncertainty and, and are now leading to a sense of anger versus acceptance of the situation. 
it's increasingly frustrating people versus being sort of grounded in, okay, we can get through this. And the last one that I'm talking about is I've started to see over the last three months or so, what I would call crashes. Before it was just a level of fatigue that people would just sometimes at the end of the week, just be exhausted and tired. But now we're seeing people kind of going along and they wake up one morning and they're angry and they're depressed. Um, people have reported to me that they wake up with ideas about harming themselves, that life, that they can't go on. Um, and it's a very deep crash that's often unexpected, but I'm finding it takes a day or two and most people can come out of it, um, but we have to be really, really cautious that people don't get stuck down in that bottom of a crash. And so I don't know if you're hearing of these kinds of things in your workforce, um, but it's, it's really concerning to me um, that, that people have enough resources that they can pull out of those kinds of crashes. So please feel free to put any comments on that in the, uh, in the chat. So I want to talk about what resilience is. Um, you know, Viktor Frankl was a, a Jewish man who was uh, interred actually in four death camps. He survived four. His, his entire family was exterminated around him. But he, he had a mission to study resilience, and he's called the father of resilience. Uh, and I often think of him when I'm in the toughest times. And he says, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. And of course, that's, uh, that's often a difficult thing to do, but that's one of the biggest challenges throughout this last year and a bit and year and a half of COVID is that we've had to change a lot of ourselves and what we expect in daily life. So what resilience is not, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that you, are, you never experience difficulty or distress. We all do, that's part of being human. WCB talked about there's normal stresses in life that we all need to cope with. And that sometimes regular life does overwhelm us and we need some help, okay? Um, that learning resilience is about learning about emotional distress and growing into that, learning how to regulate emotions, how to ask for help, how to, how to live in some pain without completely suffering. Um, but resilience isn't a personality trait. Um, it involves the behavioral choices that we make, um, the way we think about things and the actions that we take. And so that means that anybody can learn and develop uh, resilience. So it's like building a muscle. Um, it takes time and it takes intentionality. And so I've got a little um, stress reduction kit there for y'all that you might want to print and um, put on your desk if you buy your computer, if you're doing things by Zoom all the time, or if you're in an office, hang it on a door. Um, I, I find it really effective, but it does leave a bit of a red mark so people will know you've been using it. So resilience really is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and significant sources of stress. So we're in a time, we're in a time where people will be traumatized, where there will be tragedy that we will witness, um, and that our normal coping resources will be challenged. It's a reservoir that we have, and I liken it to a gas tank that we're able to carry with us, and that at times stones come up and poke holes in that gas tank and the resources leak out, uh, and we have to be able to, to patch them up. Uh, and so when we, can, when we can behave and think and act in ways that create resilience, um, those holes get patches. So when we talk about resilience, it means, and the repair um, from, from threats to our resilience, we talk about being able to connect, we talk about being able to be well, and we talk about being able to move from stinking thinking to good thinking and meaning. And, and while I say these things, they all sound lovely, but I'm sure each of us has failed in that at some point, and I'll include myself in that. And so it becomes, as employers, how do you help people? How do you give them the resources that they need uh, to do this? 
So building resilience, um, I, I tell people to go to the park and maybe be the dog. So put a sock in your mouth, run around, bite somebody's bum, um, get your belly scratched, uh, all good stuff. But people need to feel that they're not alone. Um, and in a time when they, when they can't connect in the way that they normally do, um, when it makes it harder employers to to actually show that people are not alone um, building connection is going to be one of the most important things that um, I want you to think about as I talk through this presentation about how you do that for the people that you're responsible for we need to be able to take care of our bodies um, and and be well so that means being able to be quiet um, to self-reflect it means being able to get exercise, eat well, uh, uh, and, and to do that in the face of when you feel you don't want to. It's also about really managing how you're thinking. And, and these days, that, that can be a really stressful thing for people is that, will we ever get out of this? Will I, you know, the underlying stress, will I get COVID? Even though, though I do everything right, am I going to get it? Um, and the, the last one is purpose. So purpose is about self-discovery and opportunity. So out of this time of COVID, many of us will come out with a greater sense of purpose. Certainly mine is, um, I feel very strongly about helping people keep their mental health, providing connection through therapy, through, through in-person therapy. Uh, and I, I feel like I will come out of this with, um, with my sense of purpose in life really, really strengthened. Although at the other side for me, it's been um, an exhausting and difficult process. So in support seeking, um, I'd like you to think about, we're talking about sort of individual stuff at this point, but uh, in terms of work or helping your people at work, uh, some of these things might be helpful to post. So who can you rely on? Um, and is there someone that you can't, why not? Um, or if you could rely on someone, why wouldn't you access that help? So who, who at work can help? Um, who at work can give appreciation? How can you help uh, people cope with their kids? How do you, do you have meetings? Do you have Zoom meetings? Do you have some fun? Um, if there's an emergency, who do you contact? So in terms of health, people need to be physically active. Now I know my gym's been closed for a long time and in the times that it's opened, uh, I've been too afraid to go. So I tried to buy gym equipment and goodness sakes in these times try and get that. But I got a squeaky trip out to Manitoba last September in between everything being okay and found a bunch of equipment there and brought it home. But we need healthy eating, um, adequate sleep. So if you're worried, if you're stressed, if you're overwhelmed and fatigue, sleep becomes a real issue. And without sleep, it's hard to do anything else. Uh, so if you have a fatigued workforce, I want you to start to think about where are, if you would put in the chat, where you think that fatigue is stemming from, where, you know, because that will help us decide what can you do about that fatigue? So if you could just put some in the chat um, right now, you know, a lot of what you've, you've looked at, you've told me is does that fatigue stem from work issues that you can control or is it about COVID and how do you help with that fatigue around it? So just put some stuff, I'm gonna carry on. Um, so I've just got some ideas out there that, that um, again, you're welcome to share, but uh, you know, self-care becomes important and more and more, our self-care is more and more restricted. You know, I talked to my colleagues that have been in lockdown for months and months and they're just, um, they're, they're beside themselves. One of my colleagues and we were having a Zoom meeting uh, and we were, she was talking about Groundhog Day and the doorbell rang and she came back with a stack of boxes and it was a stack of shoes and uh, shoe boxes. And she said, well, this is how I'm self-caring during COVID. Um, she's ordering 
she's ordering shoes. <laughs> so it will vary between what you can do and what works for you. But in terms of keeping, taking care of your mind, we need to keep things in perspective. Um, you know, stinking thinking is catastrophizing. Um, that we'll never get through this, uh, that life is terrible, um, that we can't control anything. Um, but what you can always control is yourself and your reactions. This is a tough time. But I think back to the times uh, of war, I look at clients who've come from war-torn countries. Uh, I look at the pandemic from a hundred years ago and think I'm so grateful uh, that, that I have the medical technology that we do, that we have the internet technology that we do. Uh, and so what I do is I focus every day, I get up and say, I'm grateful for, um, I'm grateful that I can go into an office and see people. This is what I can control. I control the actions that keep me safe. And I think about that every day and all the time. How do I keep myself safe? What do I need to accept? Uh, we can't alter the fact that COVID is here. We can't alter the fact that there's lots of things we don't know uh, about COVID um, and that we don't have all the answers and that we will have some pain, but we don't need to stay in suffering. So we need to keep a hopeful outlook. And so on an individual basis, it's visualizing the future. It's visualizing what you want as people responsible for others. It's keeping that outlook is um, we will come through this. Won't it be a celebration? Um, uh, we'll be COVID survivors, we'll have stories to tell, we will learn a lot about ourselves, uh, we will do all that we can to support you through this. Uh, and the last bit is the emotional flexibility. And one of the things that I'm finding is that we're all having to learn this. Um, I'm out of this uh, with a much more um, self-awareness, learning emotions, learning to seek help, uh, and I think that may be a silver lining that we take forward out of all of this. Hey, Pat, we've had a couple of comments in the chat that I thought I would just let you know about. Um, so Kim said, uh, in response to how she's taking care of herself, she said, I, uh, and, and the question about fatigue, um, she indicated, I find it's more about COVID and not work really for me. I spend time outside with my dog and with my cohort friends since I live alone. Um, Sylvia said, staff not taking time off. Myself, I'm glad um, the weather is nice and we can get, uh, we can spend more time outdoors. Uh, Val indicated, slow down, really prioritize goals. Can, can, and the question is, can they wait? Claire asked if, um, if that means that she can claim shoes as a medical expense. <laughs> I'm going to, I said that to my account. <laughs> Uh, Marjorie said, fatigue I noticed from people is managing competing priorities and also multiple contradicting uh, ex expectations coming from different sources during these times. Yeah. And then uh, Calvin just said the power of positive thinking. And finally, I've got a couple more here. Um, Tyla said, reflecting on what we do, uh, on what we do know for sure, and what we um, what we do, what do we do next? Small steps helps to be not so overwhelmed. Um, Sylvia said retail therapy is always welcomed. And uh, James said, I have been finding that it has been more on the lack of external things to do. I used to do a lot of volunteering, but find myself more tired now than when I was doing all of that. Yeah, and, 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 and that's a common comment. The last one is I, I'm, I'm doing less, but feel more tired. Uh, and, and again, I think it's, you know, it's reflecting of the competing priorities, uh, how much more we have to do in our work when we think about all the uh, personal protective equipment, all the protocols, all the things we have to do, plus the, the actual work that we have to do, that there's more and more expectation on us, more and more things that we have to think about. So to me, that means that we have to be offline more and more that when we go home, 
or um, that we go home to some way that we can do what, what a lot of you have talked about, get out, go for a run, um, uh, take care of ourselves. And a lot of people are finding that they go home to another set of stressors. Uh, and again, that that adds to the adds to the fatigue. So the personal power grid is something that I use a lot in my work and in myself. I have it posted in my office. Um, we need to figure out if we can act on something and we can control it, we're in mastery. So it may be one step for two steps forward, one step back, but there's a sense that we're actually getting somewhere and can control things. And this is where we want to be personally. And this is where you want your employees to be personally. So it's really um, important that people have some way and some control and some decision latitude in their jobs um, to give this sense of mastery. It's important then to recognize what we can't control. Um, if people get stuck in being frustrated and angry, they're banging their heads against a brick wall. Uh, and that's a very stressful place to be. Uh, for those things we can't control right now, we need to learn to let go. And, you know, in westernized society, um, we find that hard. Uh, so uh, it's about learning emotional coping and, and acceptance rather than always trying to, to make something happen. And the last one is, is if we, if we don't act on something we could control, like, you know, for example, if we don't act on making good decisions around our own personal safety or taking holidays, um, you know, if you're seeing fatigue in people and they're not taking their holidays, that is something that they can act on and they can control. And that's giving up. So we don't want people to be in the loop of giving up versus, you know, being frustrated. We want to get them in the loop of letting go of things that they can't control, accepting it, um, and looking at the things that they can control and taking some action on that. And so we move on then into an attitude of gratitude. So gentle reminders to yourself being very careful with comparisons, like, uh, you know, my friends down in Mexico hooting it up in Cabo. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not going to compare myself to them or anybody else. Uh, a lot of people are finding that a gratitude or just a journal, um, uh, noting how they're feeling has been very helpful to themselves during these times. Um, I often encourage people to bring out pictures or to put pictures in their journal of happy times, to write stories in their journeys about happy memories, um, while they also catalog stuff, what's going on so they can see, so they can see some trends. And a client lately just said to me after they'd um, kept a journal for a couple of weeks is, you know what? I, I'm happier than I thought I was. What I noted is I, I, I had a ha lot more happy emotions than I was giving myself credit for. And it felt really good to see that. And so purpose is one of the last pieces of personal resilience. So this is a model that looks at, you know, do, can you do what you love? Can you do what the world needs? Um, is what you're good at and what you love and what the world needs something you can be paid for? Uh, and is it something that you're good at? So all, that goes down into passion, mission, and profession. And I do find that people in the helping professions often have a really, really strong sense of purpose. And the more that you can talk to employees about purpose and mission, passion to help, the, the passion, the, the, the good that the roles that they play create, the mission that it gives is really what the world needs. Um, you know, that people who care for other people in times uh, of pandemic and stress when it's hard, there's nothing that the world needs uh, more than that right now. And, and so um, emphasizing that I'm proud, that sense of, um, you know, we're good at this, we love this, and it is exactly what the world needs uh, and what we contribute is, is so much. And so in this section, I want to talk about more organizational strategies for, for leading people uh, in work and community. Um, 
this is, I, I'm not going to go through this totally, but it's something that I hope you look at um, uh, after the presentation. Um, this was created by um, a hospital um, in, in Toronto. And it's really all that I'm, that, that I'm going to cover uh, when I talk about how you as organizational representatives uh, can, what can you commit to? And I want you to think about this as I go through this last part is, is what can you think, what can you contribute or advocate for in terms of the strategies that we're going to talk about? So it's about, you know, addressing the emotional needs of your workers, providing space for calming strategies. How do you advocate for your people institutionally, either with AHS uh, or amongst your organizations? Um, how do you provide the proper resources? Um, how do you teach people to cope? Um, and how do you provide some of the, um, the, the mindfulness practices? This is a great model and I've, I've put the reference down there below. So hopefully in this time, we can be like a flock of geese. Geese fly in a V formation because it's the most efficient um, to, have, uh, to, to fly in that. They also take turns being leaders um, so that no one person gets worn out. The honking that you hear is encouragement. The honking from behind encourages the leader to keep going. And if someone is wounded, if they're shot, they're wounded and they fall out of formation, another goose will follow them down until the goose can rejoin the uh, flock or, or they die uh, and the other goose goes back. So in terms of leading your flock um, and being that advocate, you need to be well informed. Um, you need to be able to supply resources. Um, you know, WCB has left you with resources. I'm going to leave you with uh, resources. You need to be able to reassure your people. You need to update them. Uh, you need to find ways to support healthy practices at work. And I'm going to talk about that in a sec. And you need to be real. People will not respond to, oh, everything's good, um, don't worry. Uh, they'll respond to the reality is this, and this is what we're doing about it. It's not business as usual, yet with if we work together, we can all adjust. So creating coping strategies. Uh, now, in the um, organizations that you report to, um, people need to be okay to have emotional <laughs> slips, trips, and spills. People are gonna have outbursts. They are gonna be burned out. They're gonna be fatigued. And that's your cue in that organization for people to notice and say, uh, I'm noticing this and I'm concerned, um, how can we help? Uh, is it possible to have a recovery area in, in some of the houses or disability areas or houses or, or homes where people work? Is there a way for people to get out and have physical activities? Um, is there a way for them um, to give feedback and have discussion. Uh, the last point really um, resonates on the um, uh, WCB presentation is having a good employee assistance program or counseling service uh, is incredibly important in these times that is timely and skilled uh, and, and can give the amount of time that people need to discuss their concerns. You, as safety people or contact people, need to be there for support and create opportunities for people to be heard. So I don't know if you have feedback boards, if you have meetings where people can give feedback, if you have external agencies that collect that and give that back to you. Um, can you engage with people in meetings? Um, reflect what you've heard. Um, make it okay for the people in your organizations to be upset. Um, it's not a time to quote policy. Um, you may have to from time to time. But the most important thing is that you, people feel that they are cared about and heard and that you can provide the resources that they need to be resilient. So can you create humor? Can you create enjoyment? Can you share stories? Um, you know, can you eat together, even if it's virtually? Some people have virtual lunch meetings. Sometimes we in my office will sit out um, six feet apart and, and, and have our lunch. 
Um, can you allow some flexibility? Um, I think the sharing of stories right now, um, we often share funny stories about what's happened to us during COVID, our Zoom experiences, uh, very important here. And one of the most important things is to feel connected. Uh, you know, virtual meetings are often the only way that people are feeling connected right now. But can you email people? Um, can you email some funny stuff? Can you email some how are you doings? Um, just outside of those meetings to, to keep people feeling cared for. But you have to be careful that you don't do too much because that can overwhelm people. You know, we, we're talking about Zoom fatigue uh, and that's real, that's a real, that's real. Uh, being on Zoom, um, being exposed to the light, dealing with all the, uh, the issues that come up uh, can be exhausting for people. So getting back up on the horse. So this is hopefully the stage that we're, we're starting to get in, but it's really important um, that you keep people informed about what's going on, the protocols, how, how you're handling things, being very transparent about the decisions and, and, and why they're made. Um, I've, I've just put, um, I've had some clients coming in without real medical masks and the masks are falling off. And so I've put about uh, masks up and in my correspondence with people as if they come in, I'm asking them to wear um, a medically approved mask. Um, and it's, if you can, asking people about suggestions, giving them some input. We call this uh, decision latitude um, and it's an important part of a healthy job. So you need to role model. You need to know what resources are available. You need to set boundaries around your own stuff. You need to follow the rules. And if you're sick, you need to stay at home. Um, the, this modeling is incredibly important because if I hear anything that's frustrating to people, it's when people they report to or their own organizations aren't following the rules and protocols. And lastly, no know when you or others need help. So the, the, the fatigue, exhaustion and worry, um, if it's present most of the time, that's an indication that yourself or someone else needs some help. So the first step in that may be referral to an EAP or asking them to see their doctor or suggesting that they take a day off. Um, if your sleep is chronically poor, if, if, if your substance abuse is in, increasing, if you're seeing conflict in the workplace, um, going on, um, if people are asking for ideas um, and wanting growth, these are all reasons that you need some coaching, consulting or help. And so how do you get that? You practice your own emotional regulation skills. So that means being self-aware, means being mindful. Um, it means having compassion for yourself. It means I'm if I'm tired, I need to find a way to take a break. And so what I'm challenging people to do is, is to have safety talks about psychological health and safety in the workplace. So in a meeting um, such as this or with your organizations, you may have a safety moment uh, and the safety moment may be, how are we doing with protocols? Um, I'm doing this, or do you have any safety, psychological safety concerns? Um, how, do, how are we following things? So um, having a toolbox talk about managing fatigue, um, but making psychological safety as important as any physical safety in your toolbox meetings. So what actions can you as people, add, uh, um, as people representing your organizations, what, what can you do? Um, to address emotional needs, people need either access to coaching. Can you create some buddy systems where people um, say, hey, create, uh, ask your people to say, find a buddy that you can talk to. Can you have check-ins and making sure that you have access to counseling. With people's social needs, um, there, can you put resources up on the internet about resources for family concerns? 
if you have conflict in the workplace, um, can, can you have people either be present safely or do some kind of presentation on managing conflict? And you need to keep organizational justice, which means keeping procedural justice, doing following the rules, being fair to people. Can you provide access to calming strategies for people? So in the various places where people work, is there a way to create a quiet room where people could go and breathe or meditate? I remember one time walking into a room I was supposed to be doing a presentation in, um, and I got there early and I went in and I flicked on the lights and I stepped over someone who was lying down um, on the ground um, and had been using that room. Uh, uh, and they, they said, oh, excuse me, I'm meditating. So I said, well, I'll, I'll just go out for a bit and let you finish. But is there a way to find some place where you may have a meditation program, where you have it on a computer? Uh, I want some fairly inexpensive biofeedback uh, equipment that I used to take around to a lot of oil and gas sites and everybody said, oh, they won't use that or they wouldn't like it. But there was always a lineup for people to come in and try it. So can you provide some of that? Um, can you provide a confidential forum for people to express concerns. So that may be through your uh, employee assistance program, it may be through a third party provider, but I, what people need is to be heard and what you've heard um, in the previous presentation is that people don't want to, many people are afraid to express that to their employee directly. Um, sounds like you're doing really well in, in personal um, protective equipment. Um, but it may be a time where people can take courses online and do some learning. But what I'm finding is people need opportunities to debrief. So can you have that meeting that says this is just a debrief session? Or can you encourage your people in your, in your facilities to provide some debrief? Look, this is just about how we're doing. I want to hear how you're doing. Let's debrief uh, in here and see what we can do about concerns that are raised. So that's the end of my presentation. I would um, welcome any questions on this. Uh, I'm going to get out of this. And um, uh, what I'm going to do is, yeah, I'm going to screen share again and go up to my, um, uh, okay, windows closed. I want to bring up, this is the COVID coping scale. Uh, it's available on Energy Safety Canada site, um, but it's also going to be available to you. Um, it's not letting me scroll down, but you should be able to see a little happy faces at the bottom. Um, but this is an easy way that you can um, that you can leave for your workers to complete. It's not a valid or a reliable tool yet because I've just developed it and. What I need is information back so I can see how it, how it works, but it's, it's a good way to see how people are doing. I would leave it out or I would attach it to um, an intranet where people could complete it and maybe send it on to some place. And that would give you some really good feedback on what people, the level of fatigue, and how people are doing. Okay, so... I'm going to uh, just ask if there's any questions um, and if there's how we're doing for time. I'm pretty good for time. Pat, do you so, mind if I ask a question there? Then Absolutely. I'd love it. So I think uh, lots to reflect on and, and great points. It'll take a little while to, <laughs> to absorb. But I think one of the things you mentioned about procedural justice, and, and that's been a challenge for everybody with um, uh, the number of changes. And as you're well aware, we operate in very complex environments. And I think maybe some of the challenge that leaders have is how do we reconcile supporting employees and seeing some of the uh, the issues uh, with employees struggling in the workplace, but we don't see uh, necessarily the uptake or the willingness by uh, a certain percentage of employees. Uh, for example, uh, the choice, and, and they have the choice of being vaccinated or not. So 
it creates a very tough position of the expectations of employers to provide support, safe, secure environment, and also deal with, I would say, the backlash from families to say, how, you, how could you allow employees that have the right not to be vaccinated, but to work and potentially put sites in outbreak? So it's a very fine balance respecting rights with procedural justice. Um, and yet at the end of the day, it's the leaders in, in of these sites that are trying to balance uh, what may feel like uh, impossible outcomes. Wow, <laughs> that's a big um, question and a big comment. Um, and a big, I think at this time in the, in the people that I'm seeing, it's, it's such a huge source of distress to people. So I think that's what you're noting is people are distressed, their families are angry. My, you know, my, um, my, my spouse, my mom is going to work in, in an environment, um, you know, for not everybody in their opinion is behaving safely, yet people have the right to refuse to, to be vaccinated. Uh, so I think the balance, and I'm, and I'm sure you're doing this, um, the balance is we're doing everything we can to make sure that people have access to vaccinations for those who want, who, who want it. Um, if someone is, and I'm not sure that you can do this, is, is, is working with someone that is refusing to vaccinate, has people been asking for accommodations on that? Like that's, that's something they're afraid of um, because that, those are two rights that are probably very difficult to uh, balance. But you know what I would what I would say as I'm I'm just sort of thinking this through, is that um, is to admit this is a really hard um, place for us to be as leaders. Um, while we hope and encourage that everyone would get vaccinated, um, it is an individual's right not to be, and we are we are doing everything with procedure to make sure that everybody's safe. So what you do um, is you that you continue that people mask and keep distance, uh, that people continue their safety uh, until medical people say that we are safe. And that may be uh, a while. Uh, we wish we, you, we could tell you something different, but that, that I think is one of the things that I've talked about is that's one of the realities of the situation that we have to accept. And it's really, really hard for people who want to be safe, who want to be vaccinated, um, to accept that others have that position. Um, but that is the nature of our society. And so we do all that we can. This is something I'll say, we do all that we can. And when we've done all that we can do, that's all that we can do. And that's, I think, one of those situations. So I'm sorry if I don't have a better answer to that, because I'm not sure there is. No, uh, thank you, Pat. I think you're probably right. And in some cases, it's almost stating stating the facts and stating what it is. Uh, um, and, and just coping with it as... Well, uh, and, and admitting that it's tough for everybody. It, you know, it's likely tough for those making the decisions not to be vaccinated. It's tough for those who do get vaccinated and it's tough for us to lead you through that because we've got two really different um, ideologies at work here that but both have a right to be there. So in our support of both of those, what we all need to do is, is to keep as safe as possible. So for everybody, we're keeping these safety measures to ensure that safety is our utmost um, priority. I don't envy you being in that position. Um, it's it's a real tough one. Are there other, any other questions for Pat? Pat, I just had one question about whether or not I could share a copy of the presentation. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, um, and I'll get the coping scale to you. I know I <laughs> kind of threw a lot at you. Um, and I do think it is a lot for digestion. But I think we had one last poll. Yes. Hey, Dean, can I ask you to launch that poll? Yep. 
Do I need to be screen sharing for that? No, there we are. Um, so the last poll is choose what action you can commit to doing or advocating for. And the options are ensuring resources for emotional coaching, such as counseling services, buddies, coaches, providing resources to help with family issues, access for staff to a quiet room, confidential forum for, an, for the expression of concern, online resources, proper PPE, probably based on the previous poll, you're all doing that, uh, debriefing experiences. And if you had any others that you thought of, feel free to add them to the chat. So we've got a vote. 50% people have voted. Um, I'm just going to quickly dr drop a little message in the chat to everyone. Um, I really love the, the fact that Pat said uh, sharing of stories. So for those of you that get our newsletter, you'll know that we always have what we call our, our good news stories. So we're always looking for members to share stories in these challenging times of what it is that's happening at your sites or your organizations that's made a difference. Um, so I'm gonna just put that in the chat. If you have a story, we'd love to hear it um, and we'd love to share it uh, in our uh, monthly newsletter. Okay, so we're sitting at about 80%, Dana, I think we're good. So I'm gonna end it. And sharing the results. Awesome, thanks. So 32% uh, said debriefing experiences, um, followed by 30% uh, said ensuring resources for emotional coaching, such as counseling services, buddies, and coaches. Um, and then the third vote getter was online resources. And then that was followed by access to, um, for staff to a quiet room. That was about 7% of those who responded. 5% um, uh, said confidential form for the expression of concern. And then we had 2% for each of providing resources to help with family issues and proper PPE. Yeah, okay. So proper PPE has probably been dealt with. Um, when I talk about providing resources to help with family issues, that can certainly be just having web resources is um, sending out uh, newsletters and stories about how you've dealt with family issues. So it doesn't have to be meaning providing a daycare, but that's, that's a big issue for people that I'm hearing. Um, I'm hoping that almost all your facilities have access to an employee assistance program. And if you don't, you need to have some, even a one-off service that, that you can do um, that might provide coaching or counseling um, for people. Um, and then the quiet room, where's, where's that one? Um, it's, I know it's that was seven percent access for staff yeah. to a quiet room. Yeah, where's that at the bottom there? Um, it may be hard to do, but the more that you could put um you know um sanitizing things in a room where people might go and sit in a chair and even just breathe for 10 15 minutes if they could do that in a shift you know this is outside of covid when i talk to people in you know um in mentally challenged homes workers that work that they, their day is long and emotionally exhausting so if there's any way that you can find some way to do that I think that that could make an incredible difference. Um, and I also think a forum for the expression of concern is, is, um, is something if you can find a way to do that. I, I understand that you are, <laughs> you're, you're challenged with your own resources and, and um, uh, workplace restrictions. Um, I'm glad to see that at least a third of you can find a way to provide some debriefing. I want you, you know, as, as I end this, um, I want everybody to think of that when we're through this, we're not through it mentally and emotionally and physically. I think there's going to be a long ongoing mental health crisis. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot of health and cardiovascular issues down the road from the chronic stress that we've had there. Um, so again, the more that you can 
get in place the factors in resilience, the more that you're going to prevent the long-term effects.